Let's look at a rotational dynamics example. <clears throat> Here we have um, a combination lock with a one-centered diameter knob that's part of the dial that you turn to unlock the lock. Right, you turn the knob, you grip it between your thumb and your forefinger with a force of 0.55 newtons <clears throat> as you twist your wrist. Just describing how you turn a knob, right? Um, let's say we have a coefficient of static friction between the knob and your fingers of 0.15. Uh, because some oil accidentally got on the knob. Um, so let's draw a picture. <clears throat> Perfect. Right, and you're going to pinch this knob. I'm going to move it just a little bit. We're going to pinch this knob between um, our fingers. So you're going to apply a normal force. But you're actually going to apply it on both sides. Right, because you're squeezing from one side and the other side. And when you turn, it's actually friction that causes this to rotate. Right? So let's say we're rotating it uh, this way. So that's friction here and here. <clears throat> and this is static friction if we're um, if our fingers aren't slipping on the knob. Right? And we can label there's some radius for this thing. So what is the most torque you can exert um, without having a slip? So the biggest torque we can apply here is um, is when that frictional force is the maximum frictional force, right? If we try to go any faster than that, our fingers are going to slip because we're exceeding the maximum um, static frictional force. So we need to remember Fs max. What is that? Well, it's mu s times a normal force. I have a normal force and I have mu s, so I can calculate that number. Um, <clears throat> in fact, let's do that. Right. So what I get for for that is 0.15 times a normal force of 0.55 newtons. Um, so that's um, fairly small. It's 0 0.8, uh, 0.0825. Okay. So now I need to get a torque out of this. So again. There is a normal force, but the normal force is not causing rotation because the angle between the normal force and the radius, or really, um, when we say R, so how do we calculate torque? Torque is R F sine theta. <clears throat> R is the vector that connects the axis of rotation to the point where the force is applied. So. There is the R for the left hand forces. There is the R for the right hand forces. Um, and for clarity, I'll just make the green R go away. Okay, so the angle between R and the normal force on either side is um, 180 degrees. And sine of 180 is zero, which just tells me the normal force doesn't cause any rotation, which you look at the picture and see. But it's nice that the math follows that. Um, the angle between R and the static frictional force is 90 degrees, and sine 90 is 1, which just means the static frictional force is causing torque in an optimal way, right? If um, you put these two forces together, the normal force and the static frictional force, you'd see that it's off. The angle's different from 90 degrees, but including that angle would, would tease out just the frictional force part. <clears throat> okay, so um, the net torque here is just going to be um, the torque from the left plus the torque from the right. Right? They should end up being the same number. So I could just multiply the answer by 2. But um, come on. So uh, again, torque is RF sine theta. We just said the angle is 90 degrees. So I'm not going to worry about the sine theta because sine theta is 1. So maybe I'll do this. Thing. This is 1. So it's just R times F two times. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I just need to plug that in. So R and some real trouble here. R times the static frictional force.
Um, and the way I drew this, that's causing um, torque that would be um, negative. Right, the way I drew this, this would be clockwise. So technically I should put a, a, a negative sign in there. And I've got minus R times Fs max. So just for clarity. <clears throat> so one more line here should be minus two times R is one centimeter, that's the diameter. So R is half a centimeter. Sorry, that's a little one. And the force we just determined was 0 0.0825 newtons. So if you put all that together, I get a torque of 8.25 times 10 to the minus 3 and minus 4. Yeah. Um, and that's a newton meter. Uh, I'm going to drop the negative sign again. Um, I chose the direction here, so that negative sign doesn't really mean anything. <clears throat> uh, we're just looking for a magnitude of a torque anyway. Okay, letter B. If the angular acceleration of the knob is 65 radians per second squared, what must be the moment of inertia of the knob? Okay, so what are we giving? They're giving us the angular acceleration now. And asking for moment of inertia. Now, it is tempting here um, to think there are two equations for moment of inertia, or two equations that moment of inertia shows up in. Right? One is um, the definition of moment of inertia, where it's the sum of mr squared. I also have um, the moment of inertia for a disk. Um, but we don't know what we don't know what this is yet and letter C will get to that so I can't use these yet but I also have tau net equals I alpha and look I just found tau net and they just gave me alpha so this is what I'm gonna use all right <clears throat> so let me move that so I have some more space Uh, okay, so we said 8.25 times 10 to the minus 4 newtons meters equals I times alpha, which is 65 radians per second squared. If you do this math, you get a moment of inertia that is 1.3 times 10 to the minus 5. Um, and the units on that, what are the units on that? Well, it's um, Newton meters divided by second squared. So it's um, Newton meter, actually times second squared. Um, turns out the unit for this is kilogram meter squared. Um, again, it's not incorrect to say Newton meter second squared, but a Newton is a kilogram meter um, per second squared. Uh, so that, that should work out. Okay, um, so the last bit here. If we model the knob as a di as a um, disc, oh, okay. <clears throat> so now, now we can say uh, we're modeling this knob as a um, again as a two point five centimeter disc. We already have that the knob is um, one centimeter uh, at the at where you grab it, right? So that's the literal knob. But what we're saying is. What if that knob is connected to um, a tumbler and um, a dial um, that's more massive, right? In fact, that's likely. So I'm saying the inside of this guy is a disc. How do we draw that in kind of 3D? And it's connected to the knob. So the knob is the one centimeter. Actually, that's a centimeter diameter. But inside is a massive disc. Um, with a diameter of 2.5 centimeters. 
All right, so we're applying our forces right here, but it's acting to rotate um, this thing. That's what's that's what's moving. Okay, so now that I'm I know oh we're, what we're actually rotating is a 2.5 centimeter disc. I can solve for its mass. So now I'm going to use this other equation. And again, um, the moment of inertia for point masses is mr squared, um, and you would add a bunch of them together. But this is not a point mass. This is a disk, a solid disk. So if we go back to the beginning of this lecture, you know, I see a solid disk is this one right here. Let me put an actual box around it. That's a solid disk, so it's half mr squared. So again, this one doesn't work for us right now, but i equals half mr squared. That will do it for us. Okay, so plugging in, um, i we just found, 1.3 times 10 to the minus 5. Half m I don't know, that's what I'm solving for. And the radius is 2.5 divided by 2. Right, which is 1.25, um, and that's in centimeters, so I need to multiply it by 10 to the minus 2 squared. If you do that math, you get a mass for this thing of um, 0. Oh, come on. 0. 0.1625 kilograms. Okay. So again, there are um, two confusing things here. <clears throat> Um, one is we used two definitions or two equations that had an I in it, right? We did um, the definition of I and then um, Newton's second law. The other confusing thing is we used two equations that have torque in it. Let me switch colors. Um, we saw uh, the definition of torque, right? And net torque. And we also saw this guy. So if a problem just says find the torque on this thing, there are at least two ways to go about doing it. You can calculate torque directly from forces, or you can relate torque to angular acceleration. And you have to look at what you're given to decide which one of those is more appropriate. Um, let's look quickly at the next problem. Uh, so a mass is hung from a cord wrapped around a pulley. So there's our pulley, and the box is one meter from the floor. How long does it take the box to hit the floor? Okay. Um, so for this problem, this looks like a problem we've seen before. I think it is. I just erased the other side. Um, so we've seen a problem like this before, where we had mass 1 and mass 2, and we had a massless pulley. And all the pulley did was re redirect um, the acceleration of the system. Now we're saying, what if we didn't have a massless pulley? What if we had a mass full pulley? <laughs> or a massive pulley? Right? Whatever you say there, um, this thing now has mass. Right? And so it's going to take some effort to rotate that. Um, what that means, if you, if you had a system like this, um, there would be a tension here and a tension there. And um, if the massive, if the pulley has no mass, T1 equals T2. But if the pulley has mass, they do not equal each other because it takes effort to rotate that thing. So, um, so this system, if um, if you have a massless pulley, the pulley doesn't do anything, right? But this system where you, the mass has, oh, sorry, the pulley has mass. I think I said um, mass has pulley. Um, now we need to include it in our in our system. So this is a two object system. So what do we do? We draw a free body diagram for each thing. So a free body diagram for the For the mass, right, the hanging mass is what we've seen before, y, x, but x doesn't matter here. And there are two forces acting on that. There's the weight of the box, and there's tension. Presumably, tension is smaller than weight because this thing is accelerating downward. Um, and then I draw a free body diagram for the... Um, for the pulley, and the pulley 
is a disk. Right? And the, what forces are acting here? Well, there's tension acting downward there. Um, and, you know, technically there's weight. But the weight of the pulley acts at the center of mass of the pulley, which we presume is the center, is the axis of rotation. So it doesn't cause any torque. So because I know that I'm going to apply um, Newton's second law for rotation to this guy, I don't need to think about its weight because weight is not causing rotation, right? Tension on the pulley is causing rotation. Let's label this. Uh, okay, so that radius is given to me. It's 25 centimeters. The mass of this guy is given to me as 2.3 kilograms. Um, let's call this one a little m. So this mass is 1.5 kilograms. Okay, so what are we solving for? Well, we're solving for a time. How long? Um, but that's a kinematics question. So what I need is the acceleration of this system. So this guy's going to accelerate downward. Um, at the same time, this guy's going to accelerate um, counterclockwise. Um, so I can relate those two things, right? Um, as this mass goes down, the ro this guy rotates counterclockwise. Um, yeah, the hanging mass would have a negative acceleration. Counterclockwise acceleration is what we call negative as well. So that means they have the same sign. So all I need to do is A equals alpha times the pulley radius. And if I knew this acceleration, I could then use kinematics to find how far, how long this takes to fall. So, um, so let's find. Let's do that. We'll say one. Find a and alpha. And then two. Find delta t. So I know that we can do find delta t. We've been doing that since um, early chapters in this book. Um, so let's just find a, and we'll leave alpha as a. Sorry, we'll leave. Um, Delta T is an exercise for the observer. So, um, so once I draw free body diagrams, the next step is almost always Newton's second law. And we're going to write it for both of these objects. Um, let's write it for the hanging mass first. For the hanging mass, we say the sum of the forces in the y direction equals m times a sub y. Again, that's what I've labeled A on the diagram, so I'm going to drop the Y. Um, and that should be tension minus weight, which is mg equals ma. And again, I expect that to be um, negative ultimately, which just means tension is less than mg. Um, I don't know what tension is, but um, I can use this system to solve it if I want. Uh, okay, so there's one equation and two unknowns. Tension I don't know, and A I don't know, and A is what I'm solving for. Now I can do um, Newton's second law for rotation, right? Which means um, tau equals I alpha for the for the hanging mass, or for the pulley. So tau, it's really tau net, right? Equals I alpha. The other way I could write this so that it looks more like what I've already done is um, the sigma, oops, sigma tau. It's the same thing. That sigma just means the sum of. Again, there's only one torque here. It's torque due to tension. So I'll say um, R F T uh, sine theta equals I times alpha. Well, what's I? This is a disk, right? Well, they don't say that, but uh, a pulley is generally modeled as a solid disk, which we just said is half mr squared. So let's make that go away. So that's half mr squared times alpha. Again, alpha I don't know, and the tension I don't know, but I've been labeling it as capital T. So there, sweet. So there's one other thing. Um, so theta here is 90 degrees. There's two other things at least. Theta here is 90 degrees, so sine theta gets me one. So we'll do that. But um, this tension is causing torque that is clockwise. 
and clockwise is what we call negative. We already actually invoked that because we said a equals alpha r, a is negative and alpha is negative. So, um, so I need to put that negative sign in here manually. So there's my negative sign. Great, I think we're I think we're there. So I'll write write this one more line, and that r is the same r as the radius of the pulley. So maybe I'll make that a capital R. So r t equals half m r squared alpha. Okay. So that's um, three things I don't know, right? I don't know alpha. I don't know t. I don't know a or t. But look, I have three equations to relate. So let's um, let's put those all together, right? Let's let's collect those um, off to the right. So let me make a, a division line here and say our three equations are a equals alpha r t minus m g equals m a and minus r t equals half m r squared alpha so let's plug um, maybe the top two equations into the bottom equation right at this point it's a math problem so we'll plug this guy in here and this guy in here. So if we do that, um, minus r, let's see, tension must be ma plus mg, so I'll say ma plus mg equals half m r squared, and alpha is a over r. Okay, so we can simplify this once. I'll divide by r, and um, divide by r and I've got another r here I feel like that's too many r's going away oh no we're fine okay so um, yeah again um, this r squared can go away with that r and that r. Do you see that? Divide by the r. Okay. What am I solving for? A? Okay. So let's do another line here. I can say minus ma plus, oh come on, we're almost there. Minus ma minus mg. Sorry, I guess I can't lay my hand down there equals half m times a. So I'm solving for a so I can add um, this over to the other side so I'll add this over here and it's minus mg equals half m a plus m a so I can factor out the half m plus m times a so what I get for a is um, minus mg so close. My apologies. Divided by half m plus m. Great, yeah, this should work out, right? So we plug in those numbers. Um, and what I get is um, minus, that negative sign is comforting because I know the answer should be negative. That's 1.5 kilograms for little m and 2.3 for big m. So it's 1.5 kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared divided by half times 2.3 plus 1.5. And if you do that math, we move to the next page, you get uh, minus 5.55 meters per second squared. Okay. Okay, great. That's not our final answer. It's a kinematics question to get the final bit, but um, we're, we're pretty much there. We did the hard part. We did the rotation part, which was the new thing. Um, so does that make sense? Well, it's negative. I was expecting it to be negative. That's great. It's less than G um, because if this box were falling under free fall, it would fall at 9.8 
and here it's falling at 5.5. So yeah, that's not crazy. This, this probably is correct. Um, and in fact, it is correct, but uh, it's good to gut check it. Um, so again, our procedure here is just um, Newton's second law for everything in the system. We relate the acceleration of the things in the system. Um, and then you solve, right? It's just a math problem from there. So it's not, um, it's, there's some detail management, but it's not difficult. It's just um, keeps a, a, a clear head and you'll be able to do it.